Hey folks, this is Clayton Collins, your host for the Housing News Podcast and the CEO at HW Media. Last month, I was down in Austin, Texas at the National Reverse Mortgage Lenders Association event, and I had the chance to spend some time with Chris Mayer, the CEO of Longbridge Financial. Now, introducing Chris as the CEO of Longbridge, even though they're the largest reverse wholesale mortgage lender in the country, is actually a big understatement. Chris is also a professor of finance at Columbia Business School, and his resume and experience goes back so far. He's worked in the Federal Reserve, done research and investing on Wall Street. Chris knows his stuff. And 10 years ago, he made the bet to start a reverse mortgage lender. In this conversation, we talk about Chris's experience working in the Federal Reserve, how he interprets some of the Fed messaging that we're hearing in market right now. We talk about building a reverse mortgage lender and his thesis for why he made that bet 10 or 11 years ago, and if that bet and that thesis still holds today. I hope you enjoy this conversation with Chris Mayer, the CEO of Longbridge Financial. We may have just gotten back from Gathering of Eagles, but we're not done with events for 2023 yet. This October, we're headed right back to Austin, Texas for Housing Wire Annual, and we want to see you there. We've got a power-packed agenda with content such as our Women of Influence speakers, peak performer playbooks, CEO playbooks, and more to propel your company forward, as well as a bunch of networking events. Because this event is open to real estate executives, mortgage title, and everyone in between, you really have the opportunity to network with people from all across the housing ecosystem. If you want to learn more about the event, or if you're already ready to get registered, head over to housingwire.com on the events tab and you can learn all about it. Not to mention, if you're an HW Plus member, you're going to get 50% off your ticket. So get registered for HW Plus and get registered for the event so we can see you out in Austin. All right, folks, welcome to the Housing News Podcast. I usually skip over the bios, but our guest today, Mr. Chris Mayer, his background is so incredible. I got to read you a few of the bullets of the things that Chris has accomplished and been involved with. So Chris is a Paul Milstein professor of real estate at the Columbia Business School, where his re research covers everything that, that I'm passionate about. So I'm really excited for this far-reaching conversation. Chris studies real estate and financial markets, including housing cycles, mortgage markets, debt securitization, and com commercial real estate valuation. He's a research associate at the National Bureau of Economic Research, director of the National Reverse Mortgage Lenders Association, member of the Academic Advisory Board for Standard & Poor's, and involved with the Housing Policy Center of the Urban Institute. Oh, yeah, and I forget to mention he's the CEO of Longbridge Financial. Chris, welcome to Housing News. Great to join you, Clayton. Um, got a lot of stuff happening. I, I love it. Uh, I love the the energy and activity that it takes to make an impact in in this economy and this housing market. And you are you're working all the right places. It makes me so excited for this conversation, Chris. So I want to start off talking about the reverse mortgage industry. So Chris, you had an incredible background in academia and investing and economics. And 10 years ago, you made a bet to go into the reverse mortgage industry. Tell us about the thesis and the work that led to this decision to enter the reverse market. Yes. So in other words, what's a nice guy like you doing in a place like this? Um, <laughs> yes. That's a question I get a lot. Um, so I'll sort of say I spent... You know, my background is, you know, I have a PhD in economics from MIT. I've spent a lot of my time as a professor. But one of the reasons I became a professor was to try and impact, you know, have an impact on the world and in doing things that I was passionate about, but also things that would positively impact how people, you know, you know, how people live their lives. So I wrote my first paper on reverse mortgages when I worked at the Federal Reserve back in 1994. So it was five years after the program, you know, was literally, you know, created and, you know, was probably doing a few thousand loans. At the time, I predicted, obviously not correctly, that we were going to see a huge growth in the reverse mortgage business because we had, you know, a lot of home equity and people were struggling with retirement savings. Here we're sitting almost 30 years later from that original article. And those things are still the case. You know, I was, you know, I spent some time doing a variety of things. I was, a, this is my third startup company. Um, in addition to the work I did in academia, the first was a REIT hedge fund, 
Um, we were, you know, about 80% net short the real estate market going into, um, you know, 2007, 2008. Um, and then I was involved in a startup company that was um, doing single family rentals. But at some point I decided what I wanted to do with the next stage of my life was really do something that was going to contribute to society, which was why I got to be an academic, you know, and become a professor and do research and work at the Fed in the first place. And, you know, trying to help people use home equity to have a better retirement seemed to me to be something that was really kind of, in some ways, the ultimate challenge of my career. And, you know, I wanted to jump in, not jump out to do that. And so the idea of doing that, I spent time, you know, we may talk about during the post-global financial crisis in Washington, testifying, policy, et cetera, became clear to me that if you really want to help people in this country, the way you do that is start a company um, and work on a company that does that. And that's what got me into this space back in 2012 was the opportunity to build a great company that serves seniors that helps people in their retirement. And that's really what I'm passionate about today. And so that's how I got into the business was if you want to do something, you know, don't rely on government, go do it yourself. So I want to hear more about the, the thesis and the data that, that led you to seeing this opportunity and the opportunity to help seniors fund, um, fund retirement essentially through, through uh, reverse mortgages. We've made a, a similar bet with our acquisition of Reverse Mortgage Daily. And I have my thesis on the kind of uh, massively underfunded retirement savings through 401ks, pensions, and IRAs that we're looking at for a lot of folks that are entering retirement age or even already in retirement age and seeing housing wealth as an opportunity. But I'd love to hear more about your work and analysis, which pointed toward this being a place where one, you can build a successful business and two, a place where seniors actually want and need help through a reverse mortgage. Sure. So I'll, I'll point to two things. The first is if we look at people who are entering retirement today relative to the early 1990s, um, when I first wrote that paper, what's been happening more and more is people are bringing debt into retirement. It used to be the case that 30% of people, when they hit their late 60s, had a mortgage. The people basically took out and paid off their mortgage. Starting in the 90s, and obviously many of your listeners are well aware of this because they're involved, people more and more have been using their home to live off of for basic retirement, you know, for basic expenses before retirement. And so you had a lot of people who are ending up taking on refinancing, cash out refis. We've had multiple cash out refi waves. Um, and what it's meant is that when people get to their 60s, they have a lot more mortgage debt. So today, more than 50% of people in their late 60s have mortgage payments. And if, you know, so that's one fact. People have mortgage they have to pay. And if you look at a study, for example, from the Joint Center at Harvard, for people who are bringing a mortgage into retirement, they look almost like renters in terms of the share of those people who are burdened by housing payments. 30% of people with a mortgage in retirement are spending more than 50% of their income in retirement on housing. And that's a tough, look, you can retire like that. Um, but what it does is really tough on people who are in retirement. It, so it just you look at all other, the things that sorry, people want in retirement, all the things that people want in retirement, the travel, family time, hobbies go complete back burner because your fixed income, which is a combination for most people of social security and some form of pension or IRA is going 50% to um, housing costs and probably 30 to 45 percent to healthcare with a small amount for like basic necessities of life, like like food and transportation. That's right. So, you know, we all know of people who are in this situation, whether they're relatives, whether they're relatives or friends of ours, you know, who are really, really struggling in retirement. And it doesn't need to be that way, which is to say we can, for a large number of those people, take that traditional forward mortgage, if they convert it into a reverse, that gets rid of the mortgage payment. And getting rid of the mortgage payment is changing people's lives. And I'll give you another, you know, I'm an academic, so I like pointing to research and studies and data. 
Another study out of Harvard that I found very interesting was looking at what happens the month after a senior citizen makes their last mortgage payment. And what they found is the average person spends 25% more on pharmaceuticals the month after they make their last mortgage payment, which meant the month before, presumably they were no less sick the month they made their last mortgage payment. And that meant that they're literally cutting pills. So there are people who you're talking about the healthcare expenses they're facing in retirement, and there's the donut hole and all the unreimbursed expenses that anybody in retirement knows about, you know, that the government, that Medicare doesn't pay for, particularly um, pharmaceuticals. And so you have people who are literally cutting pills that could have a better retirement, that could be taking money to help their grandkids go to college, that could help their grandkids um, buy a home, um, you know. So all of the things that people are doing, whatever they're doing, using their housing wealth at the time while they're alive allows them to be a part of their kids or grandparents, allows them to have a better retirement themselves in ways that when they die, it's kind of too late. And so that ability to do something, even if what you want to do is help your kids and grandkids, you know. A lot of people's wealth is tied up in their home and using it to do that is great. By the way, we've had two people that have taken out reverse mortgages to buy private planes. And I look at it and say, that's awesome. They want to fix them up. If what you want to do in retirement is fly a private plane, that is a great use of your wealth. Because if you let it sit in your home, that's another thing you could be doing in retirement. So whatever it is you want to do, whether it's you know, being able to basically cover your expenses of daily living, or whether it is to have a better retirement, using accessing home equity to do it is a much better approach for those people. And it opens up possibilities for them that they didn't have before. It sounds like the healthcare industry should really get behind this reverse mortgage idea because it can result in a 25% increase in healthcare spend. <laughs> <laughs> I I won't I won't say who, but I have had I've had meetings with at least one pharmaceutical company who had an academic that I knew as a consultant on the subject. There are lots of reasons why you don't want pharmaceutical companies saying, oh, by the way, go borrow against your home to pay drug costs. Like that's not the you know, it's it's not the kind of thing any of us want to be doing. But, you know, the broader point, of course, is right, which is, you know, anybody who is dealing with seniors in their day-to-day -day businesses um, should really be thinking about helping them consider home equity as a part of way to cover those costs, whether it's at-home health care, um, you know, whether it's people who are, you know, thinking about providing goods and services for seniors. And, you know, in all cases, these are things that can be helpful for how okay, they We're kind of skating into the area of the reasons why people should get a reverse mortgage, why they do get a reverse mortgage. But you and I had the chance to spend some time together in Austin in July at the National Reverse Mortgage Lenders Association, Southern Regional, I think was the conference. And um, one of the topics that came up quite a bit were the, were the reasons people don't get a reverse mortgage. And I'm consistently kind of confounded by this um, approach or, or, or line of thinking that people are really concerned about leaving their house to the next generation or like having the next generation concerned about um, what they, they inherit or, or don't inherit. When for me, when that comes at the expense of paying medical bills or traveling or doing that hobby you've always wanted to do in retirement, it doesn't quite make sense. But um, that, that's, that seems like it is a real hurdle. A reason why people don't get reverse mortgages is because they, they'd rather keep the wealth and you know, die with some wealth than, than actually use it in their, like while they're alive. I, I was surprised that, that that topic came up multiple times during that normal conference. Yeah. It, if you look at the academic research, it says the same thing. So a big part of why people don't spend down their wealth as much as academic models say they should. And, you know, you, you can, we can all be skeptical of models that economists have. Um, I have always been one of those economists that understands the models, but looks at the data, because if you don't understand people, um, you're really not going to get very far in any in any social science, um, you know, area that is trying to understand human behavior. You have to understand people and what they're trying to accomplish. So if you look at, you know, research suggests people want to give money to the next generation. 
Um, and it's important that they be able to do that. But I remember my grandparents who, um, you know, wanted to give money to their alma mater. And, you know, they graduated. My grandfather, you know, went to MIT. My grandmother went to Wellesley. And they, they sponsored lectures while they were alive. And they went to the lectures while they were alive. And I went with them. And so instead of having in their will, I'm giving so much money to this school or that school, they get to participate in it and share that with their grandkids. And doing something while you're alive is incredibly valuable and is a really rewarding way to think about things. So if the goal is to help your kids and grandkids, grandparents, if you're going to help your kids, you know, help them buy a home when they're younger instead of giving them a bequest when they're in their 50s. If you want to help your grandkids, help them, you know, leave college without debt and see them, have them come thank you in person. And the rewarding nature of doing something while you're there to participate in it. So I don't, I would never view what we should be doing as telling people what they do with their money. They earn that money. It is theirs to use and spend, and it should be. But my point and our point is really, you know, do do something while you're there to participate in it. And for seniors, a lot of that, I think they could live more rewarding and fulfilling lives with whatever it is that they want to do. And I firmly believe that our, you know, older Americans really do want to give back to younger generations. It's important to them and they should do that, but there are ways they can do it and participate in it. You know, take grand, you know, take their grandkids on vacation, like do things that allow you to, enjoy your money while you're here and while you're healthy enough to do it. I, I agree completely that we as financial services professionals shouldn't tell people what to do with their money, but the industry and like the financial services and housing industry should, you know, celebrate examples of what can be done. Like I never would have thought of the example that you just shared that what your grandparents did by sponsoring lectures and, and actually going and bringing their family. I mean, you hear constantly about ways to donate to, universities, but that's not a, that's, it's not a, a style or approach that you hear much about. And, um, and there's also like, there's stigmas associated with buying your kid's house or like, you know, being the, being the recipient of a big down payment gift. Like, I mean, that's, you, you see that in loan officer social media every day or kind of uh, the jokes about the the folks who get gifted a big down payment. Um, and I, maybe there's, maybe there's something to be said for, erasing some of those stigmas and like celebrating life and financial resources during life versus leaving something behind for something you won't be able to see. Yeah. One of, one of my earliest topics of research, which was driven by the way, by my uh, parents helping fund the first home purchase my wife and I had, um, we bought a house when I was still in grad school. I often would sort of say, you know, my wife, my wife bought the house and let me live in it because I was a grad student. But, you know, my family contributed by contributing towards the down payment. And if you look, obviously, family help with down payments is incredibly important. Large numbers of people use family wealth to help, you know, support a down payment. In fact, if you look at research on racial differences in home ownership, one of the critical factors that we don't talk about enough is the difference in wealth between black and white families means that white families are able to help their kids pay for a down payment emerge from college without debt in ways that black families are less able to do. And so the importance of family wealth in how young people emerge from school, buy homes, et cetera, is incredibly important. I think for all the skepticism people have, we should be embracing the fact that, you know, parents are willing to help their kids because huge numbers of people just could not get into the housing market without help from their families. And it's important and it's something that, you know, I, I certainly don't, I have no, I was grateful that my parents were able to help me and my wife buy a house. Um, and it was important for us. And, you know, that allowed us to accumulate wealth in our home um, over time, which is how people in the U.S. and everywhere around the world, you know, build wealth and prepare better for retirement. That's really interesting. So. Chris, I want to jump back to your your Fed experience. And we've been in a period for the last 16, 17 months where the Federal Reserve has been on a, you know, for lack of better words, a, a straight up rate crusade. And um, we've been through multiple hikes, which is 
had a massive impact on the cost of capital and the cost of mortgage interest rates in the United States. Um, in the July commentary from Jerome Powell, uh, I, after a lot of aggressive stance, it seems like we were finally starting to get a little bit of a, a reversion to um, a, a little bit of a softer tone. And he indicated that the central bank no longer forecast a nationwide economic downturn, which could be welcome news and that that soft landing that many folks have have um, hoped for or looked for. But I'd love to hear your your views with your you know experience working in the Federal Reserve Bank of Boston and, and how you've interpreted a lot of the, the messaging and actions of the Fed over the, the past year and a half. I mean, look, the Fed is struggling and has been struggling if you read the last two or three years of you know, press releases from, you know, from uh, um, Chairman Powell, you know, they've been struggling to figure out what's going on in the economy. And I think the models have done a pretty poor job of predicting both the run up in inflation and, you know, the decline in inflation um, and frankly, the labor market. So the economic models that the Fed is using and the macroeconomists are using more broadly have done sort of a pretty poor job of figuring it out. Um, so I will sort of say I was neither in the camp that inflation was never going to arrive. And I have enough gray hair to remember when we had inflation, um, in the 1970s and early eighties. And I also remember the enormous cost to the economy, the fighting inflation brought over that time period with sharp rate increases. Um, I also know and remember that when we went through that period, things didn't all happen right away. And so while I know a lot of people are very sanguine that we've avoided, that it's all good, no, no recession coming, check that box, et cetera, I'm not as sanguine as other people that, that, that we are out of the woods in any sense. And I think what they're probably not talking about, but they are thinking and ta not talking about publicly, but heavily worried about internally, is really the impact of commercial real estate and lending on the banking and financial system. And that, and that's not only banking, banks have $1.4 trillion with a T of loans that are outstanding in commercial real estate. Households, all of our clients, um, got the two and a half, three, four percent mortgage rates. That's why the economy, I think, has been so strong, is that as home prices rose and as wages went up with inflation, Housing costs didn't. And you had all these people with 30 year fixed rate mortgages that all the, you know, many of your listeners, you know, helped them get. And that meant households now are paying a record low share of their income on housing payments. And that leaves them a lot of money to spend elsewhere, which means consumers have continued to be strong, which means the labor market has continued to be strong. But where interest rates, and that historically has not been as strong as it was. We have become so efficient at refinancing people that when rates go down, we refinance large swaths of the economy very quickly. Obviously, volume today is suffering from that. The flip side of that does not happen in commercial real estate and in other sectors of the economy. Companies cleaned up their balance sheets, took a lot of fixed debt, were very careful. Owners of commercial real estate are not in the same boat. And banks have a lot, a lot, a lot of real estate loans. And so where I think we're going to see challenges are in the financial system. As a result, a lot of commercial real estate lending, but also other fixed rate lending. And I think the rate increases where we're seeing problems are things that are happening that we're starting to see more and more of in the commercial real estate area. And I think it's going to have, and it is having a meaningful impact on the availability of credit. I think that is likely to spread beyond commercial real estate and beyond jumbo lending on banks into other places. We can point to Basel and some of those other things. But I think bank balance sheet, insurance company balance sheets, even securitization are really in tough shape. And I think we are going to see some of the traditional channels of rates start to play more, which is through the financial system. And that isn't going to be such an easy fix. And so I can see some of the lags and other things in the economy having more of an impact than we've seen before. So I'm not saying and all this is going to collapse and we're going to have this huge, massive 
you know, problem. But I do think there are underlying things in the economy that the Fed isn't talking about publicly, but they are worrying about privately. That is driving some of their reluctance to continue pushing rates up. If we if we have a um, upcoming turmoil or storm coming in the commercial real estate, and commercial credit markets, which flows into um, small and regional banks, as well as our large uh, national money center center banks. How does that type of crisis flow through to affect the consumer and the homeowner? And how does that like a crisis in commercial credit start to flow into Main Street, Main Street America from an economic perspective? So I don't think the money center banks are as big a risk as the regional, you know, some regional and smaller community banks. The money center banks, because of how the Fed did the stress test, and I hate to get into the weeds with some of this, the stress test really pushed heavily against making commercial real estate loans and some of the other kinds of loans that just meant, you know, you hear the banks constantly complaining about the stress test. Well, the stress test meant that the banks didn't take some of the kinds of risks that other lenders did. So I think it is more regional, smaller banks. And some of those are heavily involved in, you know, mortgage lending and jumbo mortgages and HELOCs and, you know, other kinds of things that are affecting consumers. I think there will be some impact of that. The upside for real estate lending in general has been that because there's so many people with low interest rates, that ho- there's not a lot of selling, which has kept home prices up. And, you know, one of the things we know about how financial markets work is that distress is a big driver of collapsing prices. And without distressed sellers in housing, because everybody had these low fixed rates, consumers are not facing the kinds of pressures that would lead them to be forced sellers of houses. There aren't many foreclosures. Home prices have been solid. And so real estate, you know, housing is done well, better than people would have expected. But commercial real estate doesn't have any of those things. And I do think that it's, you know, it is continuing to show up. Regulators are doing things that we should all be a little worried about when they say, gee, you get to take a loan that has a low interest rate and it is way underwater. And you get to put it in this accounting thing called held to maturity, which basically is pretending that you don't have losses, even though you do. Um that may give forbearance to banks to some extent, but it is really just hiding the problems that the banks still know they have. And you just see these weird things in the market um, going on by banks that you look at and say, this just doesn't quite make sense. So I do think there's a lot more problem there. More loans are rolling over in 2024 than 2023, and more loans are rolling over in 2025 than 2024. So this isn't something that is likely to end quickly. We don't know whether it's going to be a crash or just a problem. But I think the Fed is looking at it and saying, if we keep raising rates, we're going to bankrupt many of the banks in this country and we can't do it. So when the regulator allows um, bank leadership to move loans to a hold to maturity category of the balance sheet, that takes those loans out of covenant and ratio calculations enabling banks to stay compliant with the regulator, basically ignoring the asset that if held in a normal part of the portfolio could push the bank into a insolvent position from a ratio perspective, correct? Correct. Okay. But the problem is if you were paying, when you made that loan, if you were paying half a percent interest on your deposits, and you got a three and a half or four percent net interest margin, and now you're paying three or four percent for deposits or more. Your net interest margin on that loan is collapsing on the on your lending portfolio. So you can move it to a different part of your balance sheet, but from a banking perspective, because you're paying so much for deposits, which is what happens when rates go up, and people will move their money away from deposits that aren't competitive into commercial pay, you know, into other, you know, into bonds or somewhere else, then you still, you can market however you want, but you still have problems with the underlying cash flow associated with running the bank. And so you're still going to have problems. You can try and hide the issue. Insurance companies are in a better shape because often their fixed rate loans are marked against, you know, 
fixed obligations, insurance contracts, and other things that they were doing that aren't as rate sensitive. But banks fund themselves a lot with deposits. But and if I understand the issue challenge. correctly, it, a lot of the issues that will hit commercial real estate owners and lenders are inflicted by some of the Fed's interest rate policy. So this is floating rate debt. So the debts, the interest payments are getting more expensive for, for the holders, which puts more pressure on the credit quality. And at the same time, when a Fed funds rate goes up, deposits kick off higher return. So it makes it more attractive for depositors to move money to money markets or CDs or like out of out of other investment opportunities. So like, does the Fed interest rate policy put more pressure on the ecosystem opposed to like solving issues that it's trying to solve? Yes. Okay. And what you described is exactly what we saw in the 1980s in the financial system. And the 70s with savings and loans and the 80s with, you know, commercial real estate lending, where increases in rates and decreases in prices led to huge numbers of failures by banks. And I can go through banks. Bank of New England was one of the largest you know, lenders in the Boston area failed over this kinds of behavior. We had huge savings and loan problems in the late 70s when rates went up. And then we had another round in the 80s. At one point, 90 percent of state chartered banks and taxes went under with the oil bust in the mid 1980s. So, the you know, so that channel, the financial sector channel where you have falling prices and rising rates has historically been the place where you've seen these problems. And the last time we saw interest rates in the short term go up as much as this was during the sort of the early 80s. So these kinds of shocks have happened before. They've had an impact in the banking and the financial system. And we should not necessarily be surprised to see that happen again. It is a very traditional channel of monetary policy through the financial system, but we just haven't gotten used to seeing it because it didn't happen for a long time. But commercial real estate led to big problems in the eighties. In the eighties, in the eighties, how did the Fed respond at this stage of the cycle in relation to monetary policy? Because it sounds to me like reversing course could um, reduce some of the pressure. But uh, how did they respond then, and how do you anticipate they'll respond this time? I mean, Volcker became famous by pushing rates up higher for longer to fight and stop inflation debt. And so what the Fed is saying about inflation is what the Fed did. You know, there were 30 years of Fed shares going back before him that kept talking about inflation, but didn't take the steps necessary. And base inflation just kept rising a little bit all the time. I will say that one difference between the economy now versus the economy then is that labor markets are just different. You know, at that time, you had a lot more union labor in the 60s, 70s, even 80s. So when the union signs a contract, you know, when inflation is high, union sign contracts and wages go up by, you know, 5% a year, 7% a year instead of 2 or 3% a year, that embeds wage growth into the economy in ways that we don't see so much today. So I do think the idea of getting embedded inflation and expectations hasn't really happened. There's not lots of data to see that people are, you know, demanding huge wage increases that are going to last for years. So I do think inflation is easier to get rid of in the labor market relative to that time. And so we face, in that sense, it's sort of good news that you know, rate increases are helpful. The The challenge is that we're seeing, you know, fiscal policy that was extremely, you know, loose. And we had, you know, trillions of dollars of checks written to consumers post-COVID. That combined with low mortgage rates for households and other things means that people really have a lot of money. There's a lot of people with a lot of money and the strong consumer spending has kept up which has made it hard to slow the economy, which is the challenge the Fed is having in terms of trying to slow inflation. Plus, you've got a war going on in, you know, Russia, you know, in Ukraine and, you know, other headwinds that are real headwinds. So it's a 
different environment. But I think the channel of the financial sector is something that we just should be continuing to watch. And it may be the case in an odd way that seeing the economy slow more than we expect would actually be good news because it would put less pressure on inflation. It would allow interest rates to fall, and that would take some of the pressure out of the financial system. You can see scenarios where, which are not like the world just collapses, et cetera. So I'm not just saying, oh, my God, the world's going to end. But there are scenarios that get pretty bad in the financial sector. And in a way, there are scenarios in which inflation stays high and the economy doesn't slow, because those are scenarios where rates continue to stay high or even have to go higher. And those are things where you then have pressure in the banking system, which then, you know, has problems, which eventually lead to a more abrupt, you know, abrupt challenges. So it's a it's a risky time at the moment. It's hard to, as a housing professional, to kind of square off what's happening in housing versus the rest of the economy, where we're still in this incredibly low unemployment environment. We still have inflation. The economy is still humming. But mortgage and real estate, we've seen volume fall off a cliff over the last 11, 12 months, um, put intense pressure on mortgage lender P&Ls, put people out of business, move people into forced consolidation scenarios, we're seeing drastic headcount reductions across across the industry. So it is a, um, you know, it takes kind of like taking off the glasses for a second to be like, oh, this is what's happening in, the, in our little corner of the ecosystem here. And we still have a, you know, relatively humming economy in like the broader US economy. And then we have this like banking slash commercial real estate crisis, like sitting on the horizons. It's a there's a lot of pieces moving. It's sometimes it's hard to like take off the mortgage hat for a minute and see everything else that's happening in the in the ecosystem. Right. I mean, one of the things I really enjoy about my career and what I do is, you know, by being, you know, by teaching at Columbia, by continuing to keep a foot in the door, there's a lot of things I learn and continue to be able to do and I do think that I'm lucky in the sense to be able to kind of talk to people and see sort of a broader perspective on how things operate. And it, you know, it helps me as a CEO make decisions that are different. You know, there have been a lot of financial stress on the companies in the reverse mortgage business. And for me to be able to, you know, one of the things we learned coming out of 2008 is the risks that duration mismatch and that securitization place on balance sheets of non-bank lenders. And we as a company, Longbridge, have been very careful in working with our parent Ellington to be careful not to load up our balance sheet and to take the kinds of risks that put the company at risk that have other, you know, that participants in this industry have done differently. And those were real lessons that came from, you know, from my background, from our background. Ellington very much thinks about the world the same way we do. Um, you know, there are real lessons you can learn. And sometimes folks in business tend to be more narrowly focused on what's going on in my little area of the world, what's going on and what I'm doing. And seeing the world a little bit more broadly can be helpful in trying to run a company, not only in the financial side and the technology side, all the different kinds of things that you're often reporting on. And so, you know, having wire kind of looking across the larger, you know, real estate universe, I think gives people who are readers the opportunity to see a broader perspective on the world. And it's one that I value personally in my day-to-day job. You have to dig into the weeds, but at the same time, seeing the forest for the trees is very helpful in seeing what's going on, you know, in the world. Yeah, and it's um it cuts it goes both directions as like housing executives, like we have to pick our heads up and see what's happening in the broader economy. But it's also cool when we see professionals from other parts of the economy and investing world looking at housing. Um we we actually just did a deal with with Bloomberg and housing wire uh content is now distributed through the terminal because there was so much demand for housing information, housing market coverage, and then coverage of the the public and private players in the housing ecosystem. So just this this week, we went live on Bloomberg, and it's really cool to see the engagement from the financial services um, industry, the analysts and investors, like jumping in and reading about the companies and people we cover in housing. Um, so that the interest is, is going both directions. 
So I'll give you I'll give you an exact example of this. One of my students, um, I was teaching this summer. One of my students sent me a housing wild article that she downloaded from Bloomberg yesterday. Boom. Perfect. So, <laughs> so <laughs> that's exactly to your point. I literally saw that happen um, yesterday from uh, one of my uh, from one of my students. So I, congratulations. Yeah, to, the first day we were live in the terminal. So like she hit it. I love I need to meet your student. She's on it. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, no, it's look, it's it's a great it's a great. That's, you know, what you're doing is really part and parcel of what we as an industry need, you know, both in the reverse mortgage sector and more broadly. We need visibility to what we're doing and in the and in the broad financial services ecosystem. And I would sort of say of all the things I do as CEO, the most important set of things are really having conversations like this with lots of people and helping them understand a reverse mortgage is just a financial product. It is a financial product like other financial products. It can be used well. It can be used badly. We focus very heavily, and the industry focuses very heavily on being responsible players and lenders in the space. And But you need to understand what we're doing and what the industry is because it offers tremendous opportunity to financial services clients, to clients of forward mortgage lenders. And if you listen to the things we talked about earlier, they're all things where there's real value. And so the more you're able to have people look more broadly at the content, the more every one of your, you know, readers and the companies in your space, the very spaces you have are going to benefit from people being able to take a broader perspective on the world. And I've always been impressed with the work that you and, you know, the team at Housing Wire and in Altos, all the different kinds of transactions are about taking a broader view of the world, bringing that to your readers, and then bringing what you're doing to the broader financial services, you know, and the broader real estate community. I appreciate that, Chris. And so on the topic of kind of looking at the broader economy, you, you've made some big decisions with your business in the last several years. So you mentioned the parent company, Ellington. Tell us about kind of the the benefits and rationale of like entering into a transaction like that, what it enables for, for long bridge and what you, you were seeking to achieve with a, you know, a, a sale of the business or a partnership, however, however you frame it. But like, I'm curious how you chose to pursue that path. Sure. So Ellington made, Ellington was the first institutional investor in long bridge. So long bridge was founded from a group of people. I was the oddball of the founders was founded from a split off of New York life. Um, one of my partners, Melissa Macerato, you know, came from MetLife and had helped MetLife Bank get into the reverse mortgage industry. So we were founded with people that came out of mainstream financial services companies, often in insurance. And our first capital came from Ellington. And Ellington was, were investors in the Heckam space and in the bond space. And Ellington has had a strategy, which is we are making strategic investments in originators because if we like investing in the collateral, we figure we can learn more about the industry and have responsible originators to sell the collateral and to create assets that Ellington can then put on its balance sheet as a, you know, at the time, you know, as a investment company now as a mortgage REIT. So they like mortgage originators and they've invested in a number of them. Longbridge is the first one they nearly fully acquired. Um, but they've invested in originators with the view that they invest in the bonds. Why not have somebody help them create mortgages that they can then securitize and sell and that helps them learn about the space? Um, so that Ellington strategy was that we were, I think, their first or second investment. And over time, they kept putting in more capital because we were delivering the kinds of performance and returns they liked. Um, and they've been delivering the kinds of synergies for us that are allowing us to grow the business, reliable capital, you know, support in terms of how to understand capital markets and pricing, how to think about the basics of what we do. And we think we're very smart about managing risk. We think we're very smart about capital markets execution. Um, and we think we're very good at certain things that working with Ellington helps us a lot to do. So it's been a great synergy. Um, you know, I will say Home Point um, was the other investor that came in with us with Ellington back in 2016. Home Point played a meaningful role in our growth and success. You know, they 
you know, and they were contributors that helped us get to this point. I know, you know, I heard some of your interviews with Phil and, you know, the, you know, the pivots that he's done. I think they've learned some lessons. We've learned some lessons. But, you know, one of the things they talked about early on was the importance of wholesale, the importance of serving customers and the importance of, you know, thinking about and using technology. There are a lot of things we learned from them that were really valuable as well. And today, Ellington, you know, at the end of last year, you know, in October of last year, Ellington bought the stake, the you know, home point stake in Longbridge and the stability and the capital have allowed us to be aggressive in making acquisitions um, and doing transactions that have been significantly accretive to, to Longbridge that have helped us to continue to grow when other people have struggled and have helped us to be profitable when other people haven't been able to be profitable. And so that has been hugely valuable. And I'm, you know, grateful for, you know, for Mike Reynos, Larry Penn, the team at Ellington for their support of us over the years. But I think we've created value for them as well. And I will say we'll continue to be doing so. And there's more coming. We're nowhere near the end of, you know, we're at the end of the beginning as opposed to the, you know, to being a lot further. There's so much opportunity ahead. Love that. Uh, Very recently, Chris Clow and our reverse mortgage daily team covered that Longbridge took the uh, the number one spot as the leading wholesale lender uh, in in reverse, according to reverse market insight data, which is a you know, a big accomplishment for an organization that's you know re- relatively relatively young. And I I um, was going to ask like if any parts of the Ellington relationship had helped propel that, but I think I'm hearing from you right now the stability, the ability to do acquisitions, the ability to run efficient capital markets. Are, are those the the pieces that helped you guide your organization to this market share leadership role? It was half of it. Um, so if you're going to be there for people in the wholesale business, we were three years ago the fifth largest wholesale lender with a 9% market share. Today, we, you know, in the latest data, we had a 27% market share and we're number one in wholesale and unseated a company that had been number one for 12 years. That is a, that is a long road. Stability matters, but so does execution. We are heavily, heavily, heavily focused on being the strongest advocate possible for our clients. We as an industry can only grow if our brokers grow. And we as an industry can only grow if we help everybody be successful. And so we took steps at critical points to help grow the business. And you hear it in the most successful wholesale lenders in the forward world. They are heavily, heavily focused on how do I help my customers do the best they can. And so we have built out platforms to help people with home purchase and to help brokers learn how to use reverse mortgages and close inside of 20 days. We've closed the loan in nine days in the purchase sector. So we can help people buy loans using a reverse mortgage. And we don't just do that for our company. Every single thing we do, we take to our wholesale clients, to our brokers, and say, we want you to do this because we're not competing with you. We're competing against all the rest of the world that doesn't understand the power of reverse mortgages to help older Americans buy homes more successfully. When we get into you know, how to work with financial planners, we do webinars that have hundreds and hundreds of brokers attending to help give them access to the training, the knowledge, you know, the tools that help them work with financial planners and to help them work with at-home care companies. So what leads us to grow is we have to close loans reliably and quickly. We have to execute for them. When markets disrupt, we have to be there. We have to stand by our pricing. All of those things matter. So Ellington helps us with the stability, but it is critical for us to run our business in ways that are about how to serve our customers and help them ultimately reach the seniors in this country who we're helping. And that commitment is what got us to be number one. Um, people don't care very much how much we sell our bonds for. They do care how we manage risk because, you know, we've stepped in, you know, when RMF 
you know, when the industry has faced problems, whether it was the RMF bankruptcy or if it was in 2020 when capital just evaporated and people were walking away from loans, in both times we stepped in in the broker community to close loans at reasonable terms. When other people were worried, we stepped in to help. And that stability from Ellington allowed us to do that. And that's how you grow in wholesale is you think about your customers, how do you make them successful? And you think about their clients and how do you make them successful? So we have more to go and you're gonna be seeing more things we're doing, but that is what drives us to number one in wholesale is how do you, how do we make everybody win? That's, that's phenomenal. I, lo I love the message, love the, the focus on execution clients and like capital and strategy. The pieces have to come together. Chris, I've got to jump. I have a housing market annual planning call coming up with my team in just a few minutes. We're working on some of our final touches on programming and speakers for housing market annual. It's coming up on October 10th down here in Austin. I got some notes from this conversation over here. I'm going to be bringing to our, bringing to our, um, our planning call in a few minutes. I can't Thank you enough for sharing your expertise and knowledge. Love this far reaching, far ranging conversation. And uh, I know it brought value to me and hope it brought up value to our audience. Chris, thank you. Great, Clayton. Thank you for, uh, thank you for having me. And, you know, I look forward to talking again. And again, I appreciate all that you do um, for our industry and, you know, your work to bring visibility um, to what we're doing with visibility and education is really what we need. And Chris, I know I gave you a teaser of this when we were at the Nirmala event, but uh, we're in the process of bringing a lot of our reverse mortgage coverage from Reverse Mortgage Daily into the housing wire ecosystem, which I think is going to be really important of bringing more awareness to what housing wealth can do to the overall housing economy and also giving us the right incentives to invest in more journalism and research to uh, fully cover what's happening in this really exciting space that is reverse. So uh, more to come on that this quarter. Um, other RMD readers have gotten used to a very specific experience for a while. We're changing that, but we're gonna do it the best way possible to make sure everybody knows it's a win for the industry. So Chris, thank you. Great, it's great great to talk to you, Clayton. And I'm, I'm a reader of all of your publications. RMD is one, but I'm a reader of others as well. I love the subscription covering it, et cetera. So I appreciate all that you do.